the feast of the Archangels, St. Michael, St. Raphael and St. Gabriel, I shall read a vision given to Maria Valtorta on December the 21st, 1945, and it's contained in her notebooks, 1945 to 50, which is the third volume of her uh, main notebooks. There are also the Quadernetti, which are the little notebooks, which were um, came out in a single volume in 2022. Oh, Father, I don't know if you realized that at the moment of Holy Communion, I was finding it hard to follow you because I was already elsewhere, intent on looking towards heaven, from which a joyful call was coming to me, with that joy which cannot be described by human comparisons and words. I had to make an effort to pull myself away from there in order to respond to you. Afterwards, trembling with joy, waves of vaster and vaster joy, the heavenly domain became progressively illuminated for me, and I saw. I saw the most radiant azures of the meadows of paradise. This vision of the heavenly regions flooded with the light which no comparison can convey, the light of paradise, indeed leads to blessedness, even if it were to remain on its own. Observe that the expanses of the heavenly kingdom struck me as much higher than the normal sky, and yet they were very distinct, as if no further away than the rooftops. And whenever I contemplate paradise, I get this sensation of infinite distance from earth, and the feeling that I am being transported beyond the earthly atmosphere to be carried close to the sky of paradise so that I can see clearly. In short, I feel wrenched away from the earth and carried far up, not into paradise, which is much higher still, but where creation is already far off with its stars and planets too. I get the feeling I'm kneeling with my soul and I would do so physically as well if a residue of watchful reflection did not keep me from showing outward signs of what is going on within me. But with my soul, I prostrate myself because I feel I'm in the sight of what is so superior to man that it should be venerated, even if it is simply limitless light and blue. From a northeastern point, Three most radiant figures, like common mortals, are coming to meet me, walking over the sapphire fields with a royal, very dignified gait, and yet they show no haughtiness. Quite the contrary, they walk nimbly without losing solemnity. They smile, observing me, and smile at one another drawing each other's attention towards me with the language of their gazes. As they approach, I see the movements of their beautiful eyes. The first ones are sapphire blue, the seconds very black, and the thirds golden chestnut, shining in the smile and light of paradise. They come up to the limit of the heavenly field beyond which there is an empty space as far as the lower terrace, where I am, venerating and enraptured. And they halt there, looking at me, smiling as only an angel can smile, clasping each other around the waist like three brothers who love one another and are taking a stroll together. They are the three archangels, Gabriel, Michael and Raphael and I shall attempt to provide a picture of them. They are three very handsome young men. They strike me as young men aged 20 or between 18 and 30. The youngest is Raphael and the oldest in appearance is Michael with a tremendous comeliness. 
The first on the right was Gabriel, apparently aged 24 or 25. Tall, slender, and very spiritualized in his enraptured features as a perpetual worshipper. Blonde, a pure gold blonde, with wavy hair barely touching his shoulders, or rather the base of his neck, clasped by a slender diamond studded ring. It resembled a band of incandescent light rather than metals and jewels. Dressed in that robe of woven light, diamonds and pearls, which I've seen often in glorious bodies. A long, loose, very pure tunic, which completely concealed his feet and barely left uncovered his right hand, quite beautiful in appearance, hanging down at his side. He was looking at me with his sapphire eyes, with such a supernatural smile that though a smile, it frightened me. The other one in the middle, also very tall, like his companion, was, as I said, awesome in his austere handsomeness. With brown hair, shorter than his companions and curlier, a sturdier build and a forehead free of all diadems, but with a kind of medal on his chest made of gold and stones and constructed like this, held up by two little golden chains. Just a pause there. When it says held up like this, there's a little diagram in the um, diary, which um, I'll just show up to the camera. It's uh, Maria Valtorza draws very primitive diagrams to try and illustrate what she's trying to, to say. Continuing, the stones set in place formed characters, perhaps a name, but I was unable to read those words, those letters which are not like our own. He was dressed in inflamed gold, a robe which was so bright that it blinded you. It looked like a light coloured flame, not reddish, but golden enveloping his nimble, robust members. His black eyes were severe and cast forth beams of light. He did not make me afraid, for I felt he was not angry with me, but rather that he loved me. But it was a gaze with an awesomeness, which must be distressing for sinners and Satan. Michael had neither a sword nor a lance, quite the opposite of the way he's portrayed, but his weapons were his eyes. Even his smile was severe, very austere. I'll pause there for a moment. For those who might be inclined to think, well, Maria Voltorti, she's making this stuff up. She's seen pictures of, um, of these archangels, like St. Michael particularly. And she's just creating a story here, a vivid imagination at work again. Well, we all know as Catholics, those paintings of um, St. Raphael, in fact, I think St. Michael, um, painted by, by Raphael, very famous painting. And the statues that are everywhere in the Catholic world. St. Matthew, St. Um, Michael has the breastplate and he looks like dressed as a Roman soldier. And he's got his sword and he's about to, or spear, lance, and he's about to thrust it into the serpent beneath his feet that he's holding there with his uh, left foot. But this is not at all what she's seen. She's seen the weapon of Michael being in his eyes. So it gives the lie to the idea that she's just taking Catholic iconography and merging it with her own imaginings. Resuming then. The third one, wearing a robe with a jewel-covered belt, a robe of a delicate emerald, seemed to be dressed exactly in the colour you see when looking at an emerald against the light. He was tall, with long dark hair, like Gabriel's, 
a precious colour of hair which is chestnut with a little sprinkling of dark gold. He looked like the youngest of all and reminded me a bit of St John the Apostle because of his gentle, youthful smile. Raphael's eyes, though, were a very soft chestnut colour with a placid, patient gaze, which is a caress. He was smiling in a more human way than the others. Everything in him was more like the way we are. He was really the good young man of the book of Tobias. You feel like putting your hand in his trustingly and saying to him, guide me in everything. I'll pause there again. The book of Tobias is in the Catholic Bible, but not in Protestant Bibles. And in fact, in itself is a really good read, but it's true. It's not just a story. And we know that because Marie Valtorta elsewhere has a vision of Tobias and Raphael and the particular event that happens where there's a, um, a great fish that seeks to devour Tobias. Again, one might say, oh, a Protestant might say, oh, no, no, this can't be true. It's all kind of, sounds like a fairy story. Well, an atheist might say that, but a Protestant dare not say that because read the, um, the book of Jonah. One can't say this is all fanciful if one accepts the book of Jonah as the Protestants do. But in, in the case of Tobias, the fish is not um, swallowing Tobias whole. I won't tell you what happens in the book of Tobias, um, but it's a good, it's what makes Saint Raphael the patron saint of, I think of married couples, or he's connected with um, those who are seeking to be married because he basically sorts, helps sort Tobias out in marrying Sarah or Sarai, I um, can't remember how her name is spelt. Um, and there's a happy ending to the book of Tobias. But I'll carry on this narrative. They looked at me, smiled, and smiled at each other. Then they greeted me. Gabriel sang with his voice like a very spiritual harp, and every note takes you into ecstasy. Hail Mary. And on saying Mary, he gathered his hands over his chest and bent his head, raising it afterwards with a smile, increasing the glowing of his entire self towards the heights of paradise. I understood that, rather than greet me, he had wished to show himself clearly. He is the archangel who announces the great mystery and seems able only to say those words and venerate the Virgin. Again, pausing momentarily. There we can get a sense of how Gabriel felt how he must have been in himself when the Annunciation took place, as St. Luke records, how he knelt there before the Blessed Virgin and told her God's plan and her place in it. Resuming now. Michael touched the jewel on his chest. He took it in the fingers of his right hand and lifted it up to show it to me and with a voice resounding like bronze, said, Whoever is with God can do all, and Satan can do nothing against whoever is with God, for who is like God? And these last words seemed to make his heavenly aura vibrate, as if from harmonious thunder. He rested his medal on his chest and knelt down, adoring the Eternal, whom I did not see, but who I would say, judging from the archangel's gaze, was perpendicular to, or right behind my back, far up, high above. Again, pausing. Michael means, who is like God. And that is why the great archangel uttered those words. Continuing. Raphael, with his golden voice, opened his arms as if to embrace me, and at the same time 
uplifted his shining face in contemplation of God and said, May joy always be with you. He somewhat resembled the angel I've seen in two visions, but he was less spiritualized than the other. At the root of his hair was a light like a star, a gentle light which brought comfort, as did his robe of shining light emerald. They continue to look at me. They then clasp each other more tightly around the waist. And note that until then I'd not noticed the wings on their backs. And open their wings of pearl, flame and pale green light. And swiftly rose into the sky, singing an unrepeatable song. Just like the one I heard on December the 13th, 1944 in Compito, when I saw the angelic cohorts flying over Bethlehem singing. And I remained here. Rather, I descended from the spheres where I had been and came back to myself, to my agonies, to my bed. The joy remained though, and I also realised that, how stupid of me, I'd been incapable of saying a word to the three archangels, but my soul spoke with them. I felt that it venerated them, even if I could not translate its beats into material words. After having received everything mentioned above, I took up the Bible to seek out every angelic apparition in it. Abraham, Jacob, Tobiah, and then the prophet Daniel passed by that way. In the eighth chapter, my glance fell upon verses 13 and 14. When I reached the sentence, quotes, he replied, from dusk to dawn for 2,300 days, and then the sanctuary will be purified, unquote. A reply, or rather an explanation, came quick as an arrow. Quote, replace the word days with centuries. For to us, a century is less than a day. And you will have the date of the end of the world. Unquote. Nothing else. The voice ceased as suddenly as it had come. And I would say it was that of my inner advisor, for it was like his.